Today is February 23rd, 2024. It is 12.29 p.m. We are at the Center for Sacramento History um, in Sacramento, California. Please state your full name and spell it, including accents if you have any. Okay, my full name is David uh, Daniel Rasul. That's R-A-S as in Samuel. Okay. Please provide your date of birth, including month, date, and year. 72147. Where were you born? Here in Sacramento. I'm Turkey bred and fed Sacramento. <laughs> Please state your marital status. Married. Do you have children? Yes, three. Uh, what are their names? David, Maria Elena, and Veronica. Okay. And where were you raised? Here in Sacramento, California. In what part of Sacramento? In uh, Barrio Diamonds, which is like down Fruit Ridge and Powering Road, Max Bear Park area. But we uh, call it Barrio Diamonds. And what did your parents do for a living? They were both cannery workers. What cannery? Brickett Richards. It's now, it used to be right here, about uh, half a mile down the street, and it's since been demolished, but they, they all worked there. And um, how long did they work there for? My daddy worked there for 45 years and had a heart attack there. And my mother worked there for 55, 56 years. Wow. Yeah. Um, do you have brothers and sisters? Yes. Rosemary uh, was the oldest. Uh, she passed away uh, three years ago. And my brother Ishmael was the middle child. He passed away this, this is past November. Yeah. I didn't so know I was that. the baby of the family. So just three of you? Yes. I'm so sorry for your loss. Mm. I didn't know. About he was a wonderful principal, yeah. wonderful educator. Yeah. Do you want my to tell brother. us where he was a principal at? He's a, well, he, he's, he's, when he came back from uh, from being in the Army, he was working as a part-time uh, teacher at Washington Elementary School downtown. And when he retired, he's a principal there. He used to be principal at, at different uh, different elementary schools. He was kind of like a hitman from the district. They'd be having trouble at one of the elementary schools, and they'd send him for two or three years to straighten out the school. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he's a wonderful bilingual teacher. Uh, what was the primary language uh, spoken at home? Both English and Spanish. It was both equally. Uh, my mom, uh, she wanted to make sure that we spoke uh, English because when she was growing up in El Paso, uh, if she spoke English in school, she had to stand in a circle during, during recess uh, as punishment. She couldn't play with anyone else. And she was always speaking Spanish. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So she wanted to make sure that we spoke up. Uh, we're good in English. Yeah. Yeah, she didn't want you to get punished. Yeah, exactly. And what about your dad? My dad spoke most, mostly English to us. My mom was the one that spoke mostly Spanish. Mm -hmm. And um, please describe your childhood experiences growing up in your neighborhood. Well, uh, my mom and dad bought the, the house on, on Bellevue Avenue in uh, 1948 when I was eight months old. And we lived there all our lives. In fact, I only lived one house away from there. My son currently lives in that house. But my mom and dad were, were workaholics. They, they worked very hard. They, in fact, uh, my one thing my dad told me before is, is, always take pride in what you do in your work and you'll never have a boss. So I always took that to heart. I always took pride in what I did. And my, my, my dad would uh, work in the cannery during the, the tomato season, 12 hours a day. And he was a mechanic, a plumber, a machinist, a carpenter, electrician. He did everything. And then after working for 12 hours during the tomato season, he'd come home and, and, and work in his house or work in the garden. So he was constantly working and doing something. And my mom, uh, I'm proud to say, she was the first uh, Mexicana head floor lady of all the canneries in Sacramento. Yeah, she was a very hard worker. She would, uh, she supervised like a thousand women at a time. So she was very, they I mean, both had very strong work ethics. Mm -hmm. They both believed in, 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 in working hard and enjoying what they were doing. Yeah. And uh, 
So I went to, my mom believed in Catholic school, so I went to All Hallows School. My brother and sister also went to Catholic school. And in fact, my, my brother and my sister and myself, we, we all three graduated from Christian Brothers High School. And it was not easy for my mom to be paying that extra money to go to, go to a Catholic school, but she made sure it happened. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about <clears throat> what it was like going to a Catholic school in that in that time period. Were there other Mexican kids, or there were there were uh, enough Mexican kids? Okay, that 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 I felt comfortable being there. I I can remember uh, crying when my mom first dropped me off. So I don't want <laughs> I don't want to leave my mother, right? But then after a while, uh, during the summer when we had that break from school. I didn't like it that much because I like being being in school. I like being around my friends because a lot of my friends, uh, which I was always jealous of, they would go to Mexico during the summer. They had familia there and primos and all this other stuff. And and my mom, on my, my dad's side, my grandmother, she was an orphan from Edmosillo. And then on my mother's side, she was also uh, my grandmother. There was an orphan from from uh, Guanajuato, not I'm sorry, not Guanajuato from. Uh, uh, from Michoacan, from Urapan. So I really didn't have any family in Mexico. So I was always jealous that they would go and have fun with their primos. Mm. So on the block that I lived, there weren't that many kids back home. So I, I found myself playing a lot with my dogs, you know, and uh, very few children were around to play with. So, And my brother and sister, <clears throat> they were like indoor people. They loved being inside and laughing and talking, listening to music and all that. Where I was more of an outdoor person, I like wanted, your dad. Yeah, like my dad. So I, well, he was working. I couldn't wait for him to get work, and then he started working in the yard, and I could be helping him. But until then, I just I played with my dog. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you so graduated was, from um, Christian Brothers in what year? Nineteen sixty-five. Okay. Yeah. It was the first all boy school, uh, first all boy graduating class. Before that, it was Bishop Armstrong where boys and girls used to go. And it went back to all boys back in 1992. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, did you experience any discrimination growing up? Yes, constantly, in fact. I remember uh, one of the first times I, 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 my, the way we went to Christian Brothers is that we worked as, as janitors. My mom uh, talked to the brothers and said, oh, we need janitors so you can pay the tuition of, of your son being a janitor. So my brother did also. So uh, one of the other brothers, one, one brother said, hey, uh, a, a guy from a, 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 a warehouse uh, with, has materials for, for, for like lumber and things like that. He's, he called the Christian brothers and wanted to know if they had anybody who wanted to do some part-time work. So, uh, I thought of you, David. So I said, okay, where's the, give me the address. I said, go there Saturday and ask for so-and-so, right? So I went there on Saturday and I asked for, uh, I went inside the place and this guy says, uh, yeah, can I help you? What do you, what do you want? He said, I said, I was referred here by brother, uh, and I forgot his name. I thought you have a, a, a job opening. And the guy said, well, I think you got the wrong, wrong place. I said, well, the guy gave me this, this name. So I gave him a name. He said, well, let me go talk to him. So the guy came out and says, I, I think you're mistaken, we don't have any jobs here. So I said, okay, maybe I went, you know, got the wrong place. So on Monday when I went back and the, and the brother asked me how it went with the job interview, and I told him what happened. And he got all pissed off and honestly, he got red in his face and he called the gentleman that, that had told me there was no jobs. And uh, he came back out and told me, this is uh, David, this is uh, uh, in, in short, he goes, because the color of your skin, you're going to run into a lot of this in your life. Uh, I hate to tell you, he says, but you got to get used to this. And you have to uh, look to yourself whenever this happens. So that's one of the first incidences that really, really caught me, you know. How old were you? I was probably uh, 15, mm -hmm. probably 15, yeah. So I took that to heart, and, and, I, and along the way, I've encountered a lot of that. You know, even in Vietnam, I encountered the same thing. You know, so uh, it's been part of my life. We just, I, after a while, you just take it, you know, and, and realize it's going to happen. Or when it does happen, like like brother told me, he says you have to look into yourself and your strength. Mm 
-hmm. and not let it affect you that much that much yeah so why don't you um, share a little bit about your your ethnicity <clears throat> well uh, my my grandfather uh, Gulam Rasul he was Punjabi he came from the Punjab in 1906 and during 1906 when he came from Punjab uh, they had what's called the Alien Exclusion Act so they allowed um, like for example men from Punjab to come over but only men not women because uh, they wanted the, the cheap labor for the men so when the men got to California and I'm talking only about the Punjabs is uh, uh, they found that they were, were, were more culturally close to Mexicana women. So they married Mexicana women. So there's about 300 families in California that are Punjab and Mexicanos. And then with, with part of my ethnicity is my mom, uh, my mom's uh, father was half Irish and half Mexican. His father came from Ireland. Uh, through New York and ended up in, in, in I think it's uh, San Luis Potosi in Mexico. So I'm I'm Mexican, Punjabi, and Irish, and I'm sure you can tell that I'm Irish very easily. <laughs> so, uh, so I grew up with that ethnicity, you know, and and part of the the fun of growing up there is the melding of the food. My my Tata Gulam, who's my grandfather up in Yuba City, and my uncle Ali. <clears throat> who, when he was in the service, he was a cook in the service. He was he was in the Air Force. Uh, they started a restaurant, and it was called Rasul El Ranchero. And it served, and on, on, the, on the placard, it says East Indian and Mexican food. So they would make curried chicken, curried lamb, rotis, halva, all Punjabi food, and mix it in with, with Mexican food, and chiladas, frijoles, and all this other stuff. So it was very, very popular up in U.S. City, very well known. So uh, that's part of it. And then... I could be up there with my, my, my dad would get off work about 4.30 from, from the cannery on Friday. <clears throat> and by 6.30, we'd be up in Yuba City. Because up in Yuba City, I had uh, seven uncles and, and three aunts that lived up there. I was the four aunts and, and, and eight uncles. So it was like a tradition for us to go up there. So I, I remember growing up having, uh, my uncles used to like to play poker with my grandfather. So I could hear the conversation and laughter of uh, both uh, uh, Hindi, Spanish, and, and, and English. It was kind of fun hearing all that and seeing that and, and being part of that. And so there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of joking, a lot of love, a lot, a lot of uh, caring for each other. In fact, when, when the, when the uh, Yuba City flooded back in 1956, the Feather River, the dam broke up there. And, and so uh, uh, my Uncle Ollie, my Uncle Benjamin, my, my grandmother uh, uh, Ines, and my grandfather, they all came to live with us in Sacramento for about six months mm -hmm. until the, it was all cleaned up, et cetera, like that. So mm -hmm. it was all a happy family. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, all yeah. Right. <clears throat> so, um, so you graduate from high school in what year? <clears throat> 65. Mm -hmm. And 65. And yeah. so tell me about what happens and how you get um, into the into the Army. Well, I graduated in, I was 17 years old. I graduated early. <clears throat> and I, uh, my brother and sister were both, when they graduated, they went to Sac State. When I graduated, I went to Sacramento City College. <clears throat> And my first semester, I was just fooling around. I was just, I was like, I was loose. I was free, right? I had a 1.2 GPA. My second semester, I had a 1.3 GPA. And then my third semester, November of 66, I was headed towards that 1.2, 1.3 GPA again. And uh, at that time, I figured, you know what? I'm not doing anybody any good, especially myself. I have no direction. I have no... I have no purpose. I have, I'm just just going nowhere. So then I decided to join the army. So and as smart as I was, that was during the Vietnam conflict. So before you know it, I found my button in Vietnam. So I I joined the army in November. I went to Fort Ord for training. I went to Fort Gordon, which uh, was in Augusta, back in 1966. And you can imagine what it was back then. Uh, I went to go get a haircut <clears throat> in Georgia, in, in, uh, in, uh, and they wouldn't cut my hair. 
I went up to get my, you know, you, you wait in line to cut your hair and you know when it's your turn. I went up there and they said, boy, go back and sit down. You come up here when I call you. So about four or five people went that I had been there before them. So I just walked out. Same thing uh, with, with uh, I went to a restaurant and they wouldn't serve me either. There was a place in, <clears throat> in, uh, in, uh, in Augusta where it was about 90 miles outside in, into South Carolina. It's called Aiken, uh, Aiken uh, no, I'm sorry, North Carolina, Aiken, North Carolina. And there was a church there where all the, the soldiers of color could go there on, on Friday and Saturday. And they had a downstairs and they would have a, a, like, a, a, like a party for, for the soldiers. So that's the only place where we could really do anything even like that. But it was, uh, it was rough there in Augusta, mm -hmm. you know, during, during that time. People know so. So let's let's talk. So then I again, that was my basics. And then when they called people out to where they were going, a lot of the I had about uh, three hundred and eighty MPs. That was MP school MPs that were going being uh, sent to different places. So they'd be calling out names and say, "Okay, you're going to, uh, to embassy duty in, in 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 Italy. You're going to embassy duty here, embassy duty there." Then they called out my name and said, oh, you're going to Vietnam. So there was me and another guy out of 380 that went to Vietnam. So let's let's just back up a little bit. So you, you told me that you um, were a student at Sac City and you, you enlisted because you were not doing good in school and you wanted some direction. I mean, had you heard about Vietnam or did you understand <clears throat> what was happening or... I understood what was happening you know, there, I, but I, I did. I mean, not in depth, not not the the, the, the depth that I knew after I, I left Vietnam. You know, but uh, before then, it was. I just wanted to get away, and do something different, do something that would kind of encourage me to to kind of be more productive. Yeah. Or do something. I, I knew there was something greater than what I was doing. That's for sure. <laughs> did you have friends or relatives that were in the army that sort of prompted you to no. like? No, no, no one prompted me to do that. Yeah, it was a complete shock to my mom and dad that I had joined. Even though, you know, I had, our family had had people in, 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 in Korean War, you know, and in, in, uh, in World War II and things like that, but uh, they, no one ever really talked to me about joining the service. From your, from your father's side, is that? From my father's side. job side? Yeah, yeah. The yeah. folks that en enlisted yeah. in World War II and yeah, in Korean, Korean. yeah. Okay, so you had that in your family, and then... Um, but it was never a, like, big thing, you know, like, like you know, so... Yeah, they weren't pushing it on you. Yeah, or, no, oh, no. So then what, what happens when you you have to pack up and go to Augusta? I mean, what, what, do, your, what do your parents say? What do your siblings say? Hardly anything. Of course, my mom hated it. You know, but but my brother and sister, they were really not, not, uh, I mean, no one wanted to see me go, for sure, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a big dramatic thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. so you, you, you go to Augusta and then you see segregation and mm -hmm. then how do you, how do you make sense of that since Sacramento's relatively diverse and people uh, yeah. sort of coexist and I mean even in your own family you yeah. have mixing yeah like, like what how do you, do you remember processing that at all or you know I, uh, I guess it was 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 very uh, more uh, more open about their discrimination Sacramento wasn't that open about it you know it was, it was something that that happened but it wasn't uh, uh, I don't want to use the word subtle because being discriminated against is not subtle, <laughs> you know, especially if you're feeling it, you know. But uh, it, it just like it, it seemed like it was uh, more mean spirited in Augusta than it was here in Sacramento. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, and you know, sometimes when I, when I was teaching, uh, things would come up like this, and along the way, I I, I I start remembering when I was discriminated, and and 
I didn't think I was discriminating that much, but then I started putting it together, and, and I, I could count numerous times where I was discriminated against, if you, you thought about it, you know, if I thought about it more and long enough, so. Yeah. Um, so, your name gets called to go to Vietnam, and what year is that? It didn't get called enlisted. No, no, no. I mean, you're in Augusta. Oh, yeah, yeah. And people are being... Oh, 1967. 67. And you're how old? I'm 18. Okay. Yeah. So you and, and this other fella get called to go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And so then what happens? Like, are you like, oh, no, we're going to Vietnam? They're sending us to to war or, or what, what, or to the hot spot or what do you, is, does that? Happen? You know, it... it I don't recall any any uh, any uh, dramatic change on my part. You know, I, I don't. I just want to go to Vietnam. It's it's the luck of, of, the, of the draw. My brother, after I enlisted and after I finished basic training, uh, and then I went to MP school, he got drafted. He gets sent to Vicenza, Italy, <laughs> for eighteen months, like it's in the Italian Alps. So, and I thought that was good because he wasn't going to Vietnam, you know, let me go instead. So, uh, I mean, that, that's one thing I, I thought about. I was happy that he was going to, to Italy, you know. Yeah. To live the life in the army, you know. Yeah, my understanding is that if one one sibling gets that's sent, basically. right, yeah. then it saves the other sibling yeah. from, from being sent to <clears> Vietnam. <throat> so you arrive to Vietnam, and what is your first impression? What the fuck did I do? What am I doing here? <laughs> Why am I doing this? So I I, I, I arrived in Saigon, and uh, they immediately put me on another helicopter, and I went up to uh, to Fubai, where I was stationed. Fubai was about twenty miles from the DMZ, and uh, and coincidentally, my future brother-in-law, my first marriage, he had been there also. His name was Butch. He was a, uh, at Hiram Johnson High School. He was a big old athlete over there. He's an he's a all-star catcher for, for their team and all that. But uh, he had been to Fubai also. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of funny that here I am, the same place where my future brother-in-law was at, so. Yeah. And so I get sent up to Fubai. And Fubai was, uh, there was, uh, we had on, on one side, we had the, the, the third Marines. And on the other side, we had 1st and 44th uh, 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 unit. The 1st and 44, what they had was the old cleat tracks, tractors, and they had put the pom-pom guns that they used to have in World War II uh, uh, battleships. They mounted them on the cleat tracks. So that was the, 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 the weapon with the pom-pom guns on top of uh, old, old tanks. And then the 1st Marine, 3rd Marine, they were the only Marine up there, and then we were the only Army up there at that time. So we were, we were the ASA, Army Security Agency. And what our compound did was we, as M I was an MP, we guarded the people that were in the compound that were monitoring flights out of China and Russia. They were like, like the security, mm -hmm. intelligence. So, so they, they uh, lived in, and worked in, 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 in air-conditioned, uh, 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 what do you call it, trailers? That's what they did. And we, because we were outside all the time, we lived in, in huts outside, so. Mm -hmm. And like for the first six months of me being there, it was like a, we had a swimming pool that the, that, the, that the CBs had made. So we had a swimming pool there. We had a, a night a, a officer's club and things like that. So it was like being at a resort, actually. Until Tet started, then it was different. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that. Well, we were warned that that uh, uh, well, like again, like I say, yeah. You know, in fact, I was uh, uh, I worked in one of, in one of the clubs because what they also had was gambling there and, and slot machines. Mm. So uh, I, I was I I always worked ever since I was uh, nine years old. I've always had a job, and I was had two jobs. You know, so, so when I was there in, in, in the army, I get off work as an MP. And then I go over there to the club and work as a as a as a cashier. And then I also worked as as, as a 
assistant manager there while I was there. Mm. So what was the... So you were saying that everything changed? Yeah, because with, with then we got intelligence in that, that, that uh, there's going to be a big offensive and around Tet, and Tet is, is, a, is a Chinese New Year. And uh, sure enough, uh, we, we were all on alert on, on that night of Tet. And uh, uh, we were on alert, but not like like in the trenches and all sorts of stuff like that. So we were on alert. So Dave Gardner, who's, who I work with, is, is in the pictures I, I had. He was from North Carolina. And, uh, and myself, we were, we were the main gate guards. And what we did during during the regular hours of, of our of our duty was easy twelve hours a day on the gate. Uh, we had uh, we had uh, uh, Vietnamese nationals coming in and work. They made, they were cooks. They were they cleaned. They did all kinds of things. And we had to make sure that anybody that came through the gate that we had searched them and that everything was all you know that they had been searched and everything was okay. Uh, so on, on that one night. Uh, Dave and I were, were taking uh, uh, taking turns uh, uh, laying down and relaxing, and we we, we got a made a, a, a kind of like a lounge chair out of out of uh, sand sandbags and things like that. So I was laying down, and and all of a sudden we hear this this sound coming in, and and uh, and that goes on all night, but mainly we hear the sounds rounds going out. Uh, rockets and things like that, but this time there was a sound that didn't sound right. So Dave and I both looked at each other. I was laying down, and Dave said, "Oh, it didn't sound right, Raz." They used to call me Raz in, in, in the army. So uh, I said, "No, not all right, not good, Dave." You know, so I just rolled over and like, hit, hit the ground flat. And Dave tried to make it to the trench line, and so the, it came in. It was a Russian rocket that came in. And the Russian rocket uh, goes out like this, which is a, a mortar would go, go out, out, outward like that. So the Russian rocket went out and it caught David in the back when he was uh, headed towards the trench line. So Dave, uh, he was all right, but he had a piece of strap on his back. If you call that all right, you <laughs> know. So uh, right. But he could walk. He could. He could. He could. He could walk and run. So, and the the. The headquarters. It was about. Uh, it was about. Yeah, what? Maybe uh, eight hundred yards away from from the main gate. So he ran down there, and, and I was uh, left there by myself. So what we had in the in the before he hit Highway One, and then the airport on the other side. So between Highway One and our main gate, there was quite a distance. And what we had was we had about uh, three sets of Constantina wire, uh, barbed wire uh, gates that we had to be in every, every, every time, you know, something would happen. So I was left by myself there. So I went out, uh, I had to go bring the, the, the Constantina wire gates in. So, and of course it was dark and all that, couldn't see anything, but uh, I had to do that. And I was crawling most of the way because I didn't know what was out there, who, who, who was there. In the meanwhile, uh, we had a, a 40 caliber machine gun right across from the main gate in a, in a little bunker. And uh, uh, Smitty, our, my, my, uh, my sergeant, arrived and found no one there. So he, uh, he uh, uh, kept on calling, he got Raz, Raz, because he already known that Dave would, would, was hurt and was, was back in the, in the headquarters. And uh, he called out several times, and I could hear him, but I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to know who else was around me, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I was getting towards the end of bringing in all, all, all the, the, the the barricades, and then I heard him going, "Raz, Raz," you know. And uh, he had, and, and I finally responded when I got closer to where I'd be safe. And I said, "Smitty, it's me out here," and he goes, "Ah, oh, Jesus!" So when I got back to the bunker uh, where the uh, machine gun was at. He said, he said, Raz, you motherfucker. He goes, he goes, I had taken off the safety on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the 40. And I was getting ready to pull the trigger one last time. It's when you, you, it almost killed you. 
because I would have started firing if you had not responded that last time. So. Yeah, because everyone's on high alert. Yeah, so they don't know who's who. Yeah, so as far as change, that's a big change. And before we we were we were kind of a quiet, uh, sleepy hollow type of a uh, uh, unit out there. Uh, almost every day we we got uh, rockets in our compound, you know, and mortar mortar shots. After that incident. After after Tet. Yeah. yeah after Tet. Yeah. And yeah. Um, do you remember the date that that happened? Probably around around February. Of sixty-eight. Yes. Uh -huh, yeah. In fact, you know, and I, I didn't put much to it, but uh, and uh, when I, when I talked to other 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 uh, other veterans, they said, "Oh, you're a Tet survivor." And I go, I "Yes, you know," but that was uh, they they use that a lot because mm. it was a big the Tet offensive was probably one of the most major battles throughout Vietnam because not only happened up where I was at because we were at 20 miles from from the from the from the DMZ, but all over Vietnam, the, the, the Tet Offensive took place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Probably, one of, probably one of the major events, battles that, that, that turned yeah. against us. Yeah. So you, you had, you had um, depicted the area in which you were situated mm -hmm. in, in, um, as, as a resort. <laughs> Right, that was your word, yeah. and then and then now you're having like real fire coming yes, at yes, you. Yeah. So what what um talk talk me through what what that feels like in terms of like your anxiety, like your sleep, you know, like your well, it, it, the anxiety part increased for sure because before we were like in the resort, you get used to it, you think, oh, I'm going to Vietnam. But then when you get to Vietnam, there I am in the quote resort area, right? And uh, it's not a, as stressful. And everyone's used to it not being stressful. Uh, and then all of a sudden you're thrown into when Ted started, you get in all this. And then in fact, we also went out uh, patrol because we had to go to a, a location that's kind of quote a farmhouse and farm area. And uh, uh, we had to go out there, there was about uh, Ten of us had volunteered to go out there and, and, and make sure that it, it was a, a safe. So we kind of had to surround the farm and, and, and infiltrate it and all that. So, so that was a different than the usual, you know. Because in Vietnam, I always saw it like like you have the the ones are in, like, like my cousin, my cousin Jacob. He was he was at a point guard in, in in the jungle, so he had that every day. In fact, he got wounded. He was uh, at point. No, I'm sorry. He was in the middle. They had the point guard, and then they had the guy in the back, and he was in the middle. And uh, they hit some uh, some landmines, and the guy in front of them, the guy in the back, they both got killed. And my cousin Jacob, we had shrapnel in his, in his back, and he had to be taken to uh, to I think uh, Japan for for surgery, things like that. And then there's so there's a combat everyday type of combat. And then you got a bright big gap and then you got people, uh, soldiers like myself that were more in the quote, like I said, resort area, you know, who are, aren't, aren't every day in, in the middle of, of, of all kinds of shit, you know. So, yeah, so active. Yeah, and then the, and sometimes I said, well, you know, I was, I was just, uh, I was just an MP there and I, I kept categorizing myself as that. And then someone once told me, says, were you in Vietnam? Said, yeah. Did you have boots on the ground? I go, yeah. He said, well, that was danger. Accept that. Don't, don't, don't diminish that, 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 that you weren't the same guy as the guy that was in the combat. In yeah, the jungle. Com yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so don't, don't diminish your, your service that you served you know, in Vietnam. So. Yeah. Um, so, like I say, it was, you know, it, it's... You're there, you could get killed any time, <laughs> more than when you're here, but, but at the same time it wasn't, you know, I, 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 I highly admired my, my, my other cousin was, was a medic in a combat zone too. So, I mean, I, I think I had it better than both of them, <laughs> to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. And we all were affected by uh, Agent Orange. 
you know, and they're all affected by that. You know, my, my, my cousin died about five years ago, my cousin Jacob, that had the shrapnel in his back. But he had a systemic heart disease uh, caused by each and orange. Mm-hmm. My other cousin that was a medic, he had uh, uh, Don Hoskins lymphoma, also from Agent Orange. Mm-hmm. And I had this kidney disease and aortic aneurysms, which uh, <clears throat> a lot of people say it should be attributed, probably attributed to the Agent Orange also. Mm-hmm. So. so tell me a little <clears throat> bit about how Agent Orange is used and what you remember or do you remember? I, I don't remember, you know, uh, later on I remember where it's this defoliation, you know, a type of uh, 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 pesticide, you know, which they just put it all over everybody, just like they do with the farm workers here in, here in uh, California. You know, they don't care if, if they're working, they just go and spray all these pesticides up right over you. So kind of use the same way, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But but now it, it's uh, the army or the U.S. or whatever they're, they're more recognizing it more and more. Just like that thing about the the Dijon or camp, or they had the, the the chemicals that were used there, and then all, uh, and now they're having some uh, preemptive uh, uh, medical issues that they're enacting. They had a PAC Act that just recently passed saying that that it's it's a preemptive which means that if you're there you you you're attributed uh to that is uh hypertension is one of them also yeah Mm -hmm. so um you had a close call did you have other close calls when you were in vietnam that you can remember well i can remember going to uh we had uh we were uh, away from geez i forgot the name of the, the port there but we had to go get supplies and it was raining like crap, you know, and uh, I had to be in front of the of the convoy, uh, not in the Jeep, but walking. And I can remember walking, pouring down rain this high up in, in, in water and having mortars going on around, you know, so, I mean, we're out in the open field and it's a easy targets, you know, so I can remember things like that. I remember going down to a convoy. Uh, from uh, from uh, from Phubai to Da Nang, which is about like 80, 90 miles away, and I was a head gunner on on, on the main uh, on the on the on the lead uh, lead truck, and getting fired at from that position. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, there was. I mean, some of this more descriptive probably <laughs> can probably explain it more, but uh, that's incidents I had, you know. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so what happens when you you're there for two years or one year? Yeah, one year. They wanted me to extend my time there, but I told them, uh, "Excuse my language. Fuck no, I'm going home. <laughs> you know, forget about this." And and also, in fact, uh, I remember going down to Saigon to 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 come home, and uh, I was in line trying to get on the plane. And 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 uh, this guy dropped dropped his watch, and I, I I and I was and I was right behind him, so he said uh, so he went over to do something. I forget what he did. And he said, "Oh no, you go you go ahead of me. I'll be right behind you." So when they cut off the people that 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 they had enough on the plane, he was. Left out. Left out <laughs> with one person. <laughs> so I turned. I turned to him. I go, sorry, you know. <laughs> but but uh, yeah. Um. So I was going to ask you. Uh, when you when you sign up for the army, it's, mm-hmm. they just do it for a year. If they send you to Vietnam, is it longer? Like if you go. No, I, I signed up for four years. For four years. Yeah. But, yeah. but you're, what do they call it? That deployed to. The deployment is only a year and then you come back to the States? Yes. Is that how that works? Yes, uh yeah. Okay. And you can re-enlist to to stay there longer if you wanted to. And they give you bonuses. Yeah, yeah. So um, you're on your way back and where do they, where do you fly back to? San Francisco? Are you back in? I flew back to San Francisco and I came home for about 30 days. Just 30 days. Yeah, yeah. And during that time is when I got married. Yeah. Because I already had a girlfriend, uh, uh, my my first wife, you know, before I went to Vietnam, and uh, 
they got, I was uh, deployed, uh, not deployed, but stationed at, at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. So you get married and you're 19? Yeah. And um, with your first wife, and um, she's waiting for you. Is this like planned or you'd like come planned, home? It was planned, it was planned, no, yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. She didn't have to wait very long, only a year. <laughs> <laughs> a lot happens in a year, David. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, and so you get married and um, she doesn't go with you to Massachusetts. No, she does. Oh, she does. Yes, yes. Okay, and so now you're both alone, away from home, in a new environment, yeah. and you're trying this marriage thing, and how does that go over there? Well, it lasted uh, two years, two months, two weeks, two days, two hours, too long. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. We found out that we were good friends, but not meant to be married. Uh, okay. Yeah. And... So, um, so how do you finish up your, your time in the Army, your four-year? Well, you know, I, I, as I told you before, I, uh, I didn't do well in school. So when I, when I uh, was there and I was getting ready to go, I found out about early, early release. So if you're going back for education and it's, it's, it's time is right without getting all complicated, so if I got released in September instead of November, I'd be able to start the semester. I put in that request and they, they, they gave me that. And I had proof that, because I had gone to, uh, while well, I was working, I'd get off work at, uh, at four uh, from my post and I'd go uh, jump in the car and I started going back to school at Northeastern University in Boston. So it was, it was about 40, 35 miles away from, from Fort Devens. So I did that three days a week. I, I started taking history. I took history and I took English. I took, I took English 1A, quote, 1A, whatever 1A means over there. And I had flunked English 1X twice at Sacramento City College. And English 1X is for hard hits. But, over, but then I, I, I got an A in the, over at Northeastern University. And I took the history class and I took, I forget what other class I took. So uh, that proved to me, because I challenged myself that I, I can I can do this. Yeah, I just wasn't ready when when at that time mm -hmm. when I dropped out of before. So, mm -hmm. and as you know, you know it's kind of funny because I I dropped out of City College uh, when I was eighteen, but I retired as the dean of counseling. <laughs> you know, here it was when I was sixty six. So from Sac City. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you. So, but but I, back to your question. This is a, we did the normal thing that that we do as as a, trying to make it work as as a, as a young married couple in you know, a place that we both of us knew nothing about. We we did that. Went up to the mountains. Went up the, wherever all the people went for tourist things and all that, and explored, etc. Ex explored the snow, which we never lived in before. We had friends there that we had from uh, from uh, from my unit that we went out with and things like that. So we just did the normal things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do, so you you're at this um, campus. It's a university or like a community college. What campus? Northwestern. You said it was called. Or it was a college. Yes. Northwestern University. University. Did you graduate or? No, like I said, I only took three classes. Oh, just I, the I, three. I dropped out. I didn't have any units at all. Okay. So that's when I, I, like I said, I took the English class that I had failed before at, at uh, City College. So you come back to Sacramento? Class. Yes. And at this time, when you come back to Sacramento, this is what, 70? Yes. And um, you're divorced now? Yes. Okay. So walk me through what happens next in your life. Well, I tried to get, I wanted to be a police officer. So uh, I went down to Pomona, and I stayed with a friend of mine, and I applied at uh, Pomona, I applied at uh, Montclair, I applied at, uh, uh, what is this, uh, I forget their names. There's, a, there's about six different uh, uh, separate police departments there in, 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 uh, in that area that I applied for, and I didn't get hired by either one of them. 
and I was pissed because I came out being a sergeant in the army and I had all these skills, but they wouldn't hire me. And uh, I, I came to the conclusion one of the reasons why they didn't hire me is, is they were advertising that they wanted, they were looking for African-American and, and, and Hispanic uh, uh, recruits, but I was just too dark. Hmm. That was my conclusion, because I passed the, the tests in all of those uh, police departments. Physically, I, no one could match me. Physically, I was, had a 28-inch waist, I had 18-inch guns. I could run like the wind. And uh, so that, that wasn't the reason. The reason was that is, I was just too dark. Mm -hmm. So. And then you come back to Sacramento? Yes, yeah. I came back to Sacramento and I started working for a... Uh, for, uh, there was a program called New Careers. Uh, Nemesio Ortiz, remember we talked about him, Nemesio yes. Ortiz, yeah. He was in charge of the program. And uh, he got me a position in the New Careers. I started working for the Human Rights Commission of all places. And uh, I, so with the Human Rights Commission, that was for low-income uh, 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 citizens where I would uh, work for 20 hours at the Human Rights Commission, and I'd go to school for 20 hours, and I'd get paid for 40. What a deal, I couldn't beat that. So fortunately, I, when I was working for the Human Rights Commission, they sent me uh, twice to a uh, summer institute for lawyers on, 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 on issues of discrimination. So mm -hmm. I became pretty expert at, 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 those, at that, uh, that position. Mm -hmm. So. Your parents must have been happy to have you back home, too. Oh, heck yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so you you work and you get remarried at when? 78, 77, yeah. Mm -hmm. And no kids from the first marriage? No, no, just no, yeah. the second marriage. And um, do you want to tell me anything about your, your long career, your work career, or...? What do you want to know? <laughs> well, what I found out is that is that I couldn't be a police officer, and I still enjoyed helping people. Yeah. So through my sister, who worked for for Washington uh, Neighborhood Council, uh, it was a small community agency that assisted the neighborhood with a, a variety of things, just all kinds of you know from from discrimination in housing, from looking for food, from from housing, from uh, advocating for the children. I mean, a whole plethora of, 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 of issues that they dealt with. I started working with my sister. And from there, I started, again, like I told you, I worked for the Human Rights Commission through uh, the New Careers Program. And uh, it just I just started on a pathway of being uh, a resource for the community in whatever way I could. And the positions I held as a mental health counselor, as a social service ad advocate, as a counselor, as a... Uh, uh, I was a director also of, of a mental health unit at, at one time, and then uh, as a counselor and as a, I worked for uh, the uh, Housing Redevelopment Agency for 17 years, and I was a planner with them. I worked with Community Development Block Grant uh, funding, which helped uh, build uh, build uh, housing units, help uh, repair streets, uh, worked with, uh, with neighborhood uh, organizations in, in, in uh, building up their community, meeting their needs. So that whole thing, that whole, uh, that whole uh, uh, umbrella of service to the community is, mm -hmm. is what I did for, for the rest of my career. Yeah, you got involved in the Chicano movement in Sacramento. Yes, 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 so, yeah. So. Got involved with uh, doing more. I wasn't an artist, <clears throat> but <clears throat> I was involved in all the traditional ceremonies that that, that we created. Like the, the first Day of los Muertos, Te de Romo, Armando Cid, uh, Dr. Arnaldo Solis, and myself were the main main uh, uh, drivers of, of the Day of los Muertos. The first one. In what year? Like in 1975. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we just continued doing that. As you well know, the Dos Muertos is one of the most celebrated uh, cultural celebrations here in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. Before there was none, then we had started with the 1975 one. And I think last year we had like like seven Dos Muertos uh, celebrations here just, just in Sacramento alone. Mm -hmm. So coming from Vietnam and then getting involved in 
mm-hmm. the Chicano movement, like how was it that you reconciled like like these sort of different worlds? Or did you see them as different? Or how did you, like, that you were... I think one served the other, you know? I, I think uh, uh, my desire to uh, to be as a resource and be helpful to the community is, is, is one part of it. The other part of it was my own uh, personal desire to uh, go beyond what I could do. I remember when I was at Christian Brothers, uh, I had a, a brother Camillus who recently passed away. He was kind of like my mentor. Uh, I was uh, I was a Spanish speaker, but not uh, a skilled Spanish speaker. So when I took Spanish in, in as a freshman and as a sophomore, I did okay, but I, I could have done better. And then when I became a, a, a junior, Brother Camillus took me out of the junior class and put me into the senior class. And Brother Camillus uh, demanded of me that I, I write a book. I mean, I, I read a book in Spanish. I do a book report in Spanish, uh, written and also orally presented it. And I remember telling Brother Camillus, uh, I says, Brother Camillus, says, how come you got me doing all this? This is uh, the, the white boys that are going to, to, to school over here. They take English class. They're not, they're not asked to do anything extra like that. Why are you doing that to me? He says, says, don't worry about them. Just you, stick a thumb in my chest, and me, you and me. Don't worry about anyone else. And he kind of like like made me go beyond what I thought I could do. Mm-hmm. He pushed you. Yeah. Yeah. Without really pushing me, he gave, put it in my mind that I could do more than what I was doing. Mm-hmm. So that kind of drove me. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there anything you want to share or anyone you want to recognize in terms of people who have passed on servicemen that you that you knew. I know you mentioned your cousins. Oh, yeah, my cousin Jacob and yeah, my cousin Ruben. Yeah. I, I, you talking about servicemen? Yeah. Okay. I do have a, a Gilbert Camino. He's my compadre. He was a medic, and he has a severe PTSD, but he's always been been active. He's always fought. And I have to give more, probably more credit to my comadre, his wife, for putting up with him, because he's had to go to the hospital a couple of times, because because of his PTSD. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he's he's been really really strong person. But uh, no, there's then once again, I I mean I mean, I have to go back to the strength of my mom and dad. They really had nothing. They were just. Young kids trying to make a living together, and they loved each other, and they loved us kids, and, and they, they always were hard workers. Mm-hmm. I mean, they always cared about us, you know, so. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't ask more from, any more than that, you know. Yeah. yeah. What advice would you give um, young people who are thinking about serving in the Army or... It's funny you, you say that, because I remember when I was a counselor at Sacramento City College, I had a mother come with her son. She made an appointment to see me because she, she had heard that I was a good counselor, et cetera, things like that. And she wanted me to convince her son not to go in the Army. So we sat down with her mother and all that, and uh, I told her mother, his mother, I'm, a, I'm not a good person for this. <laughs> I said, because the Army helped me out. The Army made me uh, probably realize what I didn't want to do. You know, probably helped me grow, gave me more discipline than I, I, I thought I needed. And, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know if, if I would be in the same position if it hadn't been for my experience in the Army. You know, and it, uh, yeah, I guess it proved to me, to myself, that I can do what I set out to do and want to do. So I, I, I couldn't not... I couldn't say, oh, don't join the army. It won't help you at all. It, it's, I mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you for your participation in this mm-hmm. interview. Um, and I am just wondering if there's anything that I didn't ask that you wish I did. Yeah, I was going to write some things down, but I didn't. Uh, uh, 
you know, and I always try to focus on the positive. That's one of the things that, that I learned because uh, I had some great friends when I was in Vietnam. You know, I still I still have contact with them, John Dill and and Smitty and and uh, some other people that that that, that I that I had ex great experiences with. You know. Uh, You know, and uh, I guess I saw some things there. You know, uh, Hui, which was about uh, eight miles from our compound. Uh, I don't know if you know, but Hui used to be the old imperial city of, of both Vietnams before they, they split up. And it was just gorgeous. I remember going, and I couldn't find it. I was looking for the pictures. I took pictures of, they had a moat around around around, around the the main part of, of, of the of the imperial city mm -hmm. and, and you walk in there they had jewels and and, and, and tile that was just so fucking beautiful it was, it was amazing mm -hmm. i went back there after tet it was just rubble the the the, the clean tracks I, t I told you about they had the pom-pom guns uh the uh, the marines were having trouble uh controlling uh uh way they were in, in fact losing the battle there in way and then they had the cleat trucks come in, and they went block by block, point blank, and fired off the the pom-pom guns. And they did the same thing to the Imperial City. Black, point blank, they, they, they fired their guns there. And it, and it was this, everything was just piled pile of, of, of mortar mm -hmm. and bricks and, and all kinds of stuff. So it, it actually really destroyed it. So, I mean, it was so, so different to see that. Yeah, how beautiful something like that went, and then it was gone in a second. You know, because of, because of the war.